Thank you all for coming back from lunch on time. And I think we're actually on time, so that's an improvement from this morning. Um, I'm from the Max Planck Institute for Ornithology, but I don't study birds. I'm mostly with birds. I'm only interested in how they taste. So if you're interested in birds, you might want to talk to Martin or someone else, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some carnivore data. Uh, some of the background is that I was doing a Fisher study, and if any of you were in some of the morning talks, you saw a little bit of that data. And I really got to thinking about how we can use movement data maybe more, uh, more closely and trying to really ask a more behavioral question with landscape function, uh, connectivity and, and corridor movement. So eventually, I'd like to welcome you guys to open your laptops and use R for a little while. So if you're interested in that, I apologize. This link was a, a little last minute, so if anyone's going to follow along, go ahead and copy that. My plan is to give you about five minutes of introduction to the paper and the whole idea, and then bring you into R, show you a little bit in the move package. I won't cover it extensively because most of it was done this morning, and then I want to show you the corridor function that we developed, and then, you know, because the corridor function itself is quite simple, show you how the inners are working behind the corridor function, and what I'm most interested in, and if I'm being fairly selfish, I'd like to see as many people as possible run it on their own data sets, because this is something we're really starting to explore, is, is this model, does this method really work for multiple species and multiple individuals, and, and, and see what we can learn from that. So I'm going to keep going, and I, I could show this again later once we open up R. So a special thanks to the people I work with, funding. I'm at the Max Planck Institute, where I work fairly, uh, very closely with Bart Kronstarber, who you saw this morning, and his supervisor, Cameron Safi. So I was kind of the field guy with an interest in computational ecology. They're the computational ecology guys with an interest in field biology. I've already covered this a little bit. So we've been here for three days already. We know we have a ton of movement data. And what we can do with it is just getting, uh, the options are getting greater and greater. For me personally, I studied uh, fishers, uh, mesocarnivore in upstate New York. And I had somewhere between every two minute uh, locations every two minutes or so to every 10 minutes or 15 minutes, depending on how well, how the improvements with the, the tracking company were coming along. And this gives you some ideas to the, the landscape they're moving in. And a little bit of background about the fisher is that uh, it does occur, as Aaron talked about a little bit uh, yesterday, it does occur across the boreal forest in, in North America. But in their western range, a lot of the populations are declining, their range is, is uh, contracting, and there's a lot of reintroduction efforts. But where I live on the east coast, they're actually expanding the range. And this has been something that's been going on for a few years, at least, and now they're even in some of these urban areas. In fact, uh, whether it's accurate or not, I got a, a, an email from a police officer in the Bronx of New York City after covering a, a Yankees game and sent me a picture of what looks very much like a male fisher on the sidewalk in, in downtown New York City. So it hasn't been authenticated, and we've all heard these stories about anecdotal sightings, but it, it could be the opposite extreme of what they're seeing out west. So what can we do with data, uh, movement data? Personally, I come from a more conservation biology background, and the big thing for me is using these data to sort of infer landscape connectivity. How are these animals moving across the landscape? And can we distinguish, or do we need to? Or how do we better understand this relationship between the functional structure, I'm uh, sorry, between the structural function, stru structural component of the landscape and the, functional, the functionality of the landscape? Now, if you want to preserve uh, animal movements and you're looking at corridors or this, these other ideas, there's several different ways you can do this. Some of the basic ones, or at least the more popular categories, are expert opinion, where we sit around a table with maps and sort of say, I think this is where moose would probably go, this is where butterflies probably go, this is where seeds are most likely going to be dispersed. If you want to take this up uh, a more analytically 
up a notch, you can take this the least cost path analysis where you're really just feeding in the, the resistance indicators of the landscape. And maybe you measure your resistance from habitat selection or something else you know about the, the animal or the animal's bio biology. Maybe you just take uh, expert opinion and then make a resistance layer. But what it does is gives you a, a, a landscape of the resistance to movement and some of the end products are a single pixel wide path. Uh, a slightly newer version of this is the least cost corridor, which has some of the basic fundamental things, but now we're looking at a slightly wider area with this sort of resistance threshold. Uh, the electrical uh, theory guys have the circuit theory, which is based on this idea of where particles or where is electrical current going to move through a landscape, again based on a landscape resistance uh, measure, but the interpretation is different. And on the bottom right, this is a circuit theory output for one of my animals. And you can, for the green means that there's high predicted flow, electrical flow. So basically this shows you where this fissure is probably going to be. And then if you look somewhat more closely, you start to see little spots where it looks like there's linear stretches of high flow, these green areas. And they're predicted to be potential corridors. So my motivation was whether we could do this from animal movement data directly. Can we look at animal movement data as a behavior and what can this behavior tell us about what they're doing in the landscape rather than coming up with a resistance and wondering whether if an animal spent time in an area does this mean that that landscape had less resistance or does it mean that it was there at night, it was day, it got stuck there for the entire day because it didn't want to leave. So I came up with the a very basic idea as to what corridors ought to look like in movement data. I thought, well, based on the theory and based on the literature, they're probably moving kind of quickly through these areas because they're not foraging areas, maybe. They're corridors. They're supposed to be facilitating this movement. And then I thought, well, if there's a structural component, then maybe they're also doing so rather in straight lines. They're going from point A to point B. They're not doing this tortuous movement where maybe it resembles foraging or GPS air location and a resting site. So I went and talked to Bart and Kami and said, can we turn this into an R script? I don't know really what it means anymore, but I have this idea and maybe if it turns into a nice simple algorithm, we can really start to explore it. And I made some rather arbitrary cutoffs. Like I said, at some point, what does fast look like? Well, maybe the high 25% of movements are fast. I don't know. And what does straight look like? Well, if the directional variant, uh, variance is less than 25%. And th then we went from there. I ran the model. And what you can see in the background, the, the thicker black lines are the step lengths. The green dots were locations, or, or I'm sorry, were segment midpoints that were identified as corridor-like behavior. So then I, we do something basic and say, OK, well, of all these behaviorally points, these points that look like corridor behavior, let's put a utilization distribution around them and help us sort of define the boundaries of the corridor. So I ran least cost pass, I ran circuit theory, I ran my model, and I said, okay, I get different results, I don't know who's better than the other, the, the models are all slightly different, and they all have their advantages and some and disadvantages. So, I went out and put a lot of cameras across the landscape in pretty much every possible, logistically possible place where one of these models thought there would be a corridor. But I also put cameras in spots that were non-corridors. So this is almost like if the animal is moving around in this big continuous habitat patch almost randomly, we should get them in their ideal habitat. And what it looks like in, in closer detail is here in a known occupied forest patch. Here's this non-corridor patch. If fissures were in there and moving randomly, we would get them eventually on a camera. There's no bait or anything like this. Here, Lee's Cost Pass said that there was probably a corridor. My model thought there was a corridor here in circuit theory, and my model also agreed. But not always. My model was the only one that thought there would be a corridor here, and Lee's Cost Pass thought there would be a corridor here in this grass, in someone's back lawn. I think it's a school playground or something like this. Um, also, some models predict that there's ones in parking lots and et cetera, et cetera. And it probably is based on your input data, but also a lot maybe on the resolution and the landscape data.
So we wrote it up. I was fortunate that uh, my model seemed to perform pretty well. We, we published it a few years ago, or a year ago now. It seems like a long time ago. Um, I put all the data that I use, all of the location data that I use online. You can go on and look at it yourself. It's here in MoveBank. And the part that I would really like you to do is check out the data. But then if you have your own data on MoveBank, or even if you don't, we can use the Move package, upload your own data, and just see if your animals are using corridors. And if they're not, what does this mean? You know, and, and ask yourself some questions. And, and ask me some questions, because I'm very interested in the idea. So I think at this point, I'd like to step out of the PowerPoint and just quickly go into R. Hopefully, maybe I can show this link again for those who just came in. This, yeah? The corridor itself as a physical structure is based on the midpoint of the segment. So it's, it's a linear feature or it's a landscape feature based on densities of locations, basically. Oops, sorry. So the corridor function requires a, a, a few packages. So just like any standard R stuff, you have to install your packages. You can, sorry, you can't see all of this. And then open your libraries. The R curl package is only for Windows users, because if you want to communicate with MoveBank, you have to get around the security certificate. Not get around it, but you have to, R can't handle it. Security certificates, open the packages, and it's probably always best to check and make sure you have the most recent versions. And I think the last time I talked to Bart, yeah, 1.2.475 is the most recent move package. Now, with the move package, we provide some data. So you can, so the data that's already cleaned, that we're familiar with, et cetera. And we really, in case you're curious about using any of the features, you can run this stuff on ours. So if we just load Leroy, who some of you may have seen earlier this morning. Am I going too fast? Or is people able to cut and paste? And then again, we want to make a um, create a move object, which has basically taking the, the attributes that are important for these analyses, so your, your latitude and longitude, etc. We know that we're interested in Leroy for this exercise, and and the move package will automatically re uh, remove missing locations. And I think we've decided not to store. So if you use GPS locations and you get a failed fix, we ignore these. So we don't import them. And then we can just take a quick look at what Leroy looks like. Something like that. And then we can add his locations. And something like 900 or 920 locations, something like this. And maybe some of you saw Bart get into a bit more detail this morning. Now, let's see if Leroy has a corridor. A corridor. So here you could see you have the corridor function. You're loading in your data. This is Leroy's data. You set your the speed proportion. Remember before I said it's a bit arbitrary, but you want to start with... 75% uh, threshold and everything above this is, is fast or it's quick. And we also want to look at this directional variance around these segment midpoints. So we're saying here that anything with a very low variance would be maybe under 0.25. So this lower 25%. And we want to plot it equals true. So we want to actually see if it's working. So let's see if we can zoom. 
maybe see it a little bit better. So you can already see that there are some light blue points up here, you know, a few here, a few here. And basically what it's doing is the, the pink and, and purple is showing you the, uh, how far, how most like a corridor point these things actually are. So this pink and purple is more like a, they're the top 90% of the quick movements and the lowest 10% of the directional variance. And it's all just based on the way Leroy is moving. So if we wanted to kind of explore these parameters and sort of decide for ourselves well, what happens if we change some of these numbers, you can do that easily by just changing the values. Here I chose 0.85 and 0.2. We can run it again, tell it to plot. And you can see now it's really focusing on this one spot. Now, because I was out there, I can sort of relate what this looks like. There is an extremely busy road that goes right through here. Um, this is a forest patch, well, it's somewhat connected. Um, down here is another forest patch, and Leroy is going beneath the road through a, a road culvert. And it's something that, when you look at this data, you think, well, there must be a corridor there, but then you do some further analyses and say, well, what is a corridor for a fisher? Maybe it's going to tell you that it's composed of roads. And that doesn't make a lot of sense. Or if you look at it the diff other way, if you build your corridor models based on their habitat preference and the habit selection, we know most animals don't prefer roads. So these approaches may not show you the exact spot where these animals are trying to cross the road and often doing successfully. So I think that's kind of an important insight that really looking from the animal's point of view gets you a little bit closer maybe to what they're really doing. And uh, for reference, I, I could show you if you want, but you'd have to take my word for this. The other model suggested that he would cross the road farther down here, which is a difference of about 400 meters. 400 meters in the Fisher's geographic range is pretty small, but when it comes to going into the Nature Conservancy, who owns all of this land, and they ask, how do we preserve Fisher movements? I could say, well, there's a little stream culvert right there that's awfully important, and you're much better off spending your time making sure this remains than trying to build a bridge or something like this for Fisher. So the quarter function itself is pretty straightforward. I think it's pretty simple. We can do some other things with it. For example, a lot of us are interested in what is the habitat or the landscape composition of such a thing. Uh, Bart did a, a nice explanation of how we can burst uh, move objects and really look at things. And so, for example, you could take uh, an animal's trajectory and burst it by the behavior. And if we say it's corridor behavior or non-corridor behavior, we could quickly do this and plot it again. Oh, sorry, don't plot it this time. Now, now we, have, uh, 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 we have an object that's only corridor behavior. So only these uh, pink points, these segments with this, these that have been identified as a corridor. Then if we want to calculate utilization distribution of these things and really quantify their selection for a corridor, we have to transform uh, the latitude and longitude coordinates into something planar. We do this with SP transform. And then we can use BART's Brownian bridge, dynamic Brownian bridge estimator, and calculate a UD quickly. Is there any questions? Oh, and we, now we can plot it. So now you can see, if you remember where these locations were in the segment, now we have a utilization distribution that we can then export and ask other questions about what is the habitat composition in there, et cetera. Also, if we want to burst the trajectories, the actual step, uh, sorry, step lengths by the same, oh, sorry, they're not, they're not overlapping. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, 
same idea. Now these uh, movement steps are coded for corridor behavior or not. Sorry, I screwed up my R window. And now they're not overlapping. R Studio problem. So if you're really interested in, yeah. Uh, Leroy is every 15, I think. Uh, the largest uh, time gap that I have is 15 minutes. Okay. So this is why, I mean, I, uh, I have people from uh, Chicago to Bhutan doing these things, but I haven't seen it myself. So which is why I'm actually quite keen on this. I mean, I'm fairly certain that there's definitely some sort of threshold as to the amount of time uh, between each successive location, et cetera. Uh, and I'd be really interested to see how this pans out. I mean, you have a bit of a, a trade-off, right, between the number of locations you get within a time period versus how long you get these locations. And so for Leroy, it's about a month. So within the month, I can see that this looks like a corridor. But I wonder if two months, three months, a year, you would start to see other things that may be a corridor. And I think this is totally dependent on the study and, and how they're set up. But it would be really nice to really quantify that kind of question. So if you were to really get into the, the background, you can run this quick. And it will show you all the steps. And we don't have to run through them all now. But I can give more or less a quick explanation as to what's going on. Basically, the first step is checking to make sure you have everything you need. You have this package installed, et cetera. Great. If not, you get an error message. You know, go install, this, go install the map tools for, uh, package. Then we're taking, we're measuring the, the step length. Pretty, pretty basic stuff. And then if your data set accidentally only has two locations, we'll warn you, oh, by the way, we can't calculate step length. Then estimating the speed. And then we're doing this quantile function, where is this above 75%, et cetera. Calculate the segment midpoint and then the radius and something that took me a little while and a lot of uh, dry erase board to sort out is how to calculate the circular variance of a bearing, uh, uh, an azimuth that is 45 degrees, and then the opposite direction is negative 45 degrees. And in calculating this variance, I had to come up with something that I started calling a pseudo azimuth, and then Bart thought apparently that was a good enough name. And if you go to the paper, there's, there's, a, there's a figure that sort of describes how an animal going in, you know, from left to right of the room, and then going back again from the right to the left, how you can transform these azimuth values into basically the same number, and then so that your variance estimates are low. Because this is what we're really looking for, is this bi-directional travel. Not necessarily the animal always going in the same direction, because this could be infinite. We don't know where it's going or whether it was functionally moving back and forth. So now we have the segment midpoint. We put a radius that's equal to half the st step length around this midpoint. We look at all of the points, the segment midpoints that fall within this radius, and we're looking at the sort of basically all of its neighboring steps. And once you have all of its neighboring midpoints in this radius, you're calculating the mean speed and the circular variance. And then here's where we start thinking about what is it, the behavior. So we identify something that looks like corridor behavior if they meet both of our previous uh, requirements, if it's above the 0.75 speed threshold and below the 0.25 uh, circular variance threshold. And then whether, uh, so I showed you before this, this initial Leroy quarter plot, and there was those extra points that were falling out in other places. Often you get points that meet these requirements, but a one or two time event may not be enough to really justify calling it a corridor. So then we say, well, within this radius, you have to have more corridor like behavior than non corridor like behavior. We assign this information these categories. We can plot it if we want. We can create a new 
uh, object it exports the, 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 mid the x and y coordinates and the midpoints, the speed, the directional variance, etc. And then you have a corridor object. Is there any questions about that? I don't know how I'm doing for time. Almost over, I think. Oh, I have an hour? Well, <laughs> originally I thought I had a half an hour. So I would say then, for those of you that are interested, I'd really invite you to try it with your own data. Um, I can give you some code. I can show you um, maybe off camera how to upload your own data to MoveBank if you want, um, and really just try to play with it for a little while. So I, I think I could probably close the tutorial there, and I'm happy to talk in the next half an hour with anyone who wants to explore it on their own. So, right, so this would go for a break. In the meantime, if somebody 